Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, today, we are very happy to have Misha Berkus from Weissman, and he'll be telling us about multi-trace correlators in the SYK model and their gravitational interpretation. Uh, over to you, Misha. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, let's see, let's see. Uh, okay, so so uh, I'm going to talk about multi-trace correlators and, and some aspects of their gravitational uh, interpretation. It's it's a ongoing work. Uh, I think uh, we, we kind of have one point that, uh, well, we have a couple of points that, that we can make, but for sure, I mean, it's, it's very far from being a complete story in, in any form. Uh, this is work uh, recently, that recently appeared on the archive with uh, Nadav Bruckner, who's a student, Vladi Norovlansky, who's a postdoc at, uh, in Princeton, and Amir Raz, who's uh, a student at, uh, at Austin. Uh, okay, so um, I basically, okay, so, so we'll go to some uh, setup and framework, what exactly we're trying to calculate. I mean, these things will not be particularly shocking or surprising. We'll basically be computing a expectation values of multi-trace operators. A, I'm going to start by a, showing how we compute the leading order. The computation again will be fairly uh, straightforward. And, and then I suspect people have seen uh, bits and pieces or version of it in the, in the literature. Um, so probably it would just be a repackaging of what uh, some of you know. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, two traces, and then I'm going to generalize this to an arbitrary number of traces and the uh, higher and higher order corrections. Uh, the, qu the main thing I would like to get to, although that's the least established part uh, in the paper, is how uh, these uh, these correlators show up in space-time. You know, what's the effective description that we need to give in space-time in order to reproduce these correlations? And um, you will see basically that there's a certain structure emerging uh, that has to do with uh, having to add more fields. In order to do that, we'll need to go beyond the leading order in the computation of the traces. And uh, we're going to discuss uh, some uh, a additional sub-leading corrections and the gravitational dual. So, so I think uh, you know much of this is kind of a, a warm up, and uh, this would be, I think, where the new stuff uh, lies. Uh, although I suspect I'll get to that only kind of briefly. Um, okay, what happened here? So I'm using a new software, which is never a good idea, but uh, okay. Uh, okay, so, so I'm going to start with just uh, uh, some setup of what exactly I'm trying to, uh, to compute. And again, these would be multi-trace correlators and they are related to uh, multi-boundary space types. Uh, this is a uh, transparency which uh, I'm sure you've seen the likes of uh, ad nauseum. This is uh, the SYK model. We have uh, N Majorana fermion satisfying uh, anti commutation relations. And we have a random uh, all to all uh, P local uh, interaction. And uh, um, many of you guys have worked on it much more than I have. And you're familiar with all the aspects of these models and have participated in, in uh, developing them. Uh, so uh, we are interested in the end going to infinity limit, as you know, and for the purposes of what I'm going to discuss, uh, we can either take uh, p fixed and end going to infinity, which is the standard limit, uh, or we can take uh, uh, p in the double scaling limit, so it scales like square root of n, and we take both p and n to infinity. And, and the reason that we're, we're interested in, we, we can work with both of these quantities is that uh, really the correlators will not uh, depend on the exact features of, uh, say, the partition function. And I'll be precise about it, but let me set up first what we are trying to do. So uh, what we are trying to compute are 
uh, the connected uh, multi-trace uh, correlators. So an expectation value, this expectation value means I'm, and with the subscript J, means that I'm computing the ensemble average over the J's. Like, so the J's are drawn from some Gaussian ensemble. So uh, I have a bunch of traces. Let's say I have N of those. And uh, I'm using basically the moment method or variance of the moment method, or it's kind of implicit uh, in the discussion. So I'm computing trace H to the K1 up to trace H to the KN, the product of those. All of those, all of these are evaluated in a given realization. And only then I'm doing the expectation value. And uh, what I'm interested in is uh, the connected part of this. So, so basically, if I give you these, uh, correlation functions which are not the connected, there's some uh, recursion relation that tells you what's the connected part. Of it. This is kind of, of course, uh, very standard. Now, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to have an expression for these objects in terms of some transformations that are built upon these NKs. Uh, and so I'm going basically just jumping, I'll, I'll explain, I'll give you an example in a minute. But I'm going to have some, some operator acting on MK1 up to MKN that will give me the connected part of this correlation function. Now, this operator is evaluated in some 1 over N to some coefficient uh, expansion, and we'll be computing the leading and subleading parts of this. And I'm really kind of agnostic as to, to what order I'm exactly computing uh, these correlators. So I can use whatever approximation I want or, or you know, think about plugging in the exact expression if I'm interested. But it's really this guy that, that I'm evaluating to order uh, one over n to the appropriate k. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, feel free to stop me at, uh, at any time, of course. Uh, okay, so for example, at leading order, which is where I do most of the technical uh, uh, derivation, uh, the connected piece uh, of uh, uh, two traces is just given by this expression. Uh, and it's basically just uh, given by some combinatorics, uh, just coming from the fact that the J's are Gaussian and there's some uh, weak contraction of J's between the two uh, uh, between the two traces. Uh, and this is, uh, okay, and this is just trace H to the K1 expectation value. And this guy is trace H to the K2 expectation value. Uh, and, and again, I can evaluate this exact, think about this as the exact expression or, or evaluate it to whatever, in whatever approximation that I'm interested. Now, the small expansion parameter is this uh, n choose p to the minus one. Now, of course, you see, all of these guys can receive whatever corrections if I'm computing in some uh, in, in one over n. Uh, however, this expression is the leading guy in this power of uh, n choose p to the minus one. Uh, okay, so just uh, if I just continue with this, uh, I can take this uh, two trace correlator and I can turn it into an expression for the connected part uh, of the uh, energy distribution. But uh, what's a little bit more interesting is that using pretty much the same tools, uh, you can show something a little bit uh, different. So, so let's start by just uh, thinking about uh, taking our rho zero the thing that's, uh, that's given just by trace of H to the K and kind of just a uh, kind of a uh, shrinking, shrinking or expanding and just uh, dilating it with some a uh, parameter H. Okay, then this guy, this expression is just given by uh, the leading term, the leading connected part of an, integral, of an integral over two rows, rho E1H and rho E2H. So this is, uh, well, I should have called this E and E prime, I guess, since this is what I used over here. Okay, so, so E1 is E and E2 is E prime. 
So I can get this kind of a connected expression by taking, dilating uh, two spectra by the same amount, and then doing some average over the amount by which I'm kind of shrinking or expanding the spectrum. And this gives, and if I just look at the connected piece in this expression to leading order, I'm going to get uh, this expression. So, so this is uh, basically just tells me that there's a, I'll refer to it sometimes as a global mode, some uh, uncertainty, the leading, uh, the leading correlation just comes from shrinking or expanding the spectrum. And there's a certain distribution on how much I shrink and correlate uh, uh, the spectrum going from realization to realization. Now, uh, what's interesting is that you can uh, write an expression like this, not just a uh, two leading order. You can take this operation, now this is the, the same operation. We keep the, this operation uh, to be the same. And then I can write an expression for the connected uh, energy distribution uh, again act uh, by some taking uh, uh, you know as many of these rows that I'm interested shrinking and dilating them by the same amount and then saying that the parameter that shrinks uh, or expands the spectrum is the same throughout the distribution so I'm going to do an integral over h with some uh, with some p of h and this P of H, uh, one can write it down. It's basically, again, related to some Gaussian distribution with some, some a few more uh, bells and whistles. Sorry, question? Yes. Is this connected correlator row connected E, E prime factorizes between E and E prime? What, say that again? It factorizes, looks like, in, uh, in a formula. Well, I, I mean, uh, I mean, it's a it's a product. But when you integrate over, what, suppose I go from, I mean, you have a requirement, of course, when you integrate over d e prime rho uh, e e prime, uh, you're going to get uh, zero. So, well, if uh, uh, let, let me do this for the full guy. This is just going to be rho of e, right? And this uh, this uh, formula satisfies it. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, to, to this uh, leading all the, yeah, this is just the expression that you get. But you no, cannot I, turn this, I mean, you cannot turn this into just a shift of four zero, if that's what you mean. No, I just uh, uh, w wonder what's the connection between this row connected EE e prime and uh, like, uh, so, uh, sorry, what, 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 I'm just confused. What was the definition of row connected EE e prime? It's not row uh, E, row E prime connected correlator, right? What? Uh, th this, this is a, a It's not yeah, a density no, density correlator. It is uh, uh, row connected E, E prime. This is row zero, uh -huh. and then there is a correction. This is this correction, okay? You, you can't get it by shifting row zero. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I was just uh, uh, wondering what's the connection between that and the density density correlator in the uh, like in the JT gravity, where it's a random matrix uh, result which have like one over e minus e prime. It doesn't. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm yeah. uh, okay, so so uh, I mean I, I'm going to get to this uh, later, but uh, right, the, the whole point is that uh, these correlators are not things that are included in JT. Again, if you just think about JT as a, an ordinary random matrix theory, maybe with some crazy potential or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, these are things that come from correlation of J's. And of course, you know, that's the folklore I learned from you guys at various stages that uh, because J correlate many matrix elements, you expect to have some other structure just uh, that kind of kicks in at mm -hmm. time scales which are much shorter than uh, one over the energy separation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I'm going to discuss the relation to uh, JT and, and where exactly this matches, you know, how it supple supplements the results of uh, the ordinary random matrix theory. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, Mika, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I've never worked on this. I need to make sure I mm -hmm. understand. Um, M is a special operator involving the Hamiltonian, the trace H to the K one or whatever. Uh, right, it's this guy. 
did you say correct? H is the Hamilton. Yes, yes, yes. And that is right. why it is, that is why it's related to the some correlator of dense of density of states at different energies. Exactly. Right. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Just just making sure I. Right. So, right. So so this this is basically just uh, you know d rho uh, d e rho zero of e e to the k. Yes, 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 got it. Okay, so it's not that you're computing, you know, any old operator correlation functions in the theory. It's this. Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, this is just the Hamilton. This is the Hamilton. I mean, we also compute, we also compute fluctuations of correlation functions of certain class of operators that I won't get to there. No, no, no worries. So I just, I, yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure I knew what you were doing. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, one uh, other question on this slide. Sorry, the it looks mm -hmm. like the um. It looks like the expression, the first expression for rho c of e and e prime mm -hmm. factorizes, but the second expression, a line below it, two lines below it, does not. Is this one? Uh, yeah. Is that one somehow resumming also some higher order terms? Or? Uh, so, I, so if I want to go from this guy to this guy, I just take the leading, uh, the leading piece in epsilon. So that's how I'm going to get uh, this guy. And, th and that's basically just, you know, bringing down the variance of the Gaussian. Okay. Okay. Uh, th this guy, uh, this guy resums, uh, again, th th this is also true just at leading order. But within this leading order, there's going to be like a whole bunch of combinatorial expressions that you need to take into account. Okay, and this and this p of h, uh, I mean, this is going to be the same p of h irrespective of how many rows you put in, and therefore you'll be probing more and more pieces of p and h basically as you put in more uh, more rows. Okay, yeah, I understand. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I, okay, so, so okay, th this is um, something a little bit, uh, okay, let me skip. The, well, okay, so, so, so basically the way you're supposed to think about this is that, uh, uh, let me just summarize this. Uh, okay, so, so this is our expression and uh, this is basically our, uh, and this is kind of a raw that changes from realization to re realization. And if I'm interested in computing the expectation value of four, I take n to infinity, uh, bin things, and then I take the size of the bin to zero. So, so I'm going to have some, at the end of the day, something, uh, something like this, some distribution uh, of this type. Now, uh, of course, from realization to realization, uh, this uh, distribution changes a little bit, okay? But uh, at least under some favorable circumstances, you don't have to go all the way to the, to the description using delta functions if you want to say how this uh, distribution fluctuates. You can, uh, you know, if this is the original fluctuation, uh, Excuse my uh, calligraphy. Then uh, there's a mode, for example. Then you know, if then in some realization it will be slightly expanded. In some realization, it will be slightly, slightly, uh, uh, slightly contracted. Or I could, you know, have some bulge showing up somewhere in a, in some other realizations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, what I'm kind of interested in something which is halfway between this description in terms of discrete energies and going all the way to rho zero. So I'm interested in these marginal fluctuations of the smooth distribution. And under favorable circumstances, in, in, in the, there would be situations like this, say in random matrix theory. Uh, I mean, it's always the case that there is a leading uh, distribution of fluctuations, which uh, you can discuss. And sometimes you can get to higher orders, which will be the case, uh, which will be the case here. Okay, th there's, there's a certain issue that uh, about universality, these would be universal in some precise uh, sense. They are much more robust 
to changing the fluctuation, this, the distribution of the J's, whereas these guys would be sensitive to uh, the details of the distributions of the, of the J's. But here I'm going to assume that uh, the J's uh, have a Gaussian distribution. Uh, okay, another thing that I'm going to use occasionally is uh, I to have to introduce a class of observables. And by observables, I'm going to mean uh, operators which are essentially of the same spectral nature as the Hamiltonian, except that they have a different length. So the Hamiltonian has some length P, that's the amount of fermions that show up in the multi-index uh, interaction. But I can have uh, some other operators characterized by some length P prime, which I'm going to take again a sum over all uh, multi-fermion uh, interactions, but of length P prime with coefficients which are random Gaussian variables. Now, uh, the motivation for this, uh, I, I mean, it's kind of natural to think about this because if you think about the situation where you have, say, some ABS2 cross something in the infrared, and here maybe you have some ABSP times some other manifold, uh, then your class of operators is really determined by what happens here, right? Because this is where your boundary theory exists, and, and operators are boundary conditions in the ABS CFT. So, uh, this defines how many operators you have, whereas the SYK description is valid in this uh, in this region. So you can ask, you know, how do these operators translate into something that acts on the SYK or products of SYK degrees of freedom? And uh, since the local T00 flows to some, the Hamiltonian flows to some random uh, operator, the local T00, flows to some random operator, you might as, as well expect that all multi, all single trace in the sense of ABS CFT operators flow to some random operators, but they could then have different conformal dimensions. So, so this is a natural answer. So what's the operators that you have in the theory? And we'll see that uh, they, they kind of pop out in a natural way. But you don't assume there's a relation between J tilde and J, right? Uh, there's no relation between J tilde and J, but to, to in, leading to leading order. Yeah, but in this in this block picture, if you said what you those words, uh, there sounds like there should be some relation between uh, a, a J and J tilde. Yeah, so 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 of course this is just a, this is just something very very rough. I mean, there's something which I mean I don't know how to make this precise in any way. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, because you need to take into account, say, the fact that the operators in the UV form some algebra and you want to see what that does in the infrared. So there should be some remnant of spatial locality in the infrared. Okay, uh, you are right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I confess, I confess. But this is a very rough picture. Uh, okay, so, so, so let me summarize the result. Uh, and but, but let me first um, kind of try and say where they more or less fit in the, in the recent development. Uh, so again, I, I mean, this is not where I, I should be uh, explaining uh, this, but, but the, these are the two, uh, if you wish, kind of uh, anchors that uh, one might want to keep in mind we're trying, we're trying to kind of put our work in, in some kind of uh, perspective. Uh, so, so one thing is uh, the, 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 the discussion of the very late time uh, spectral form factor. Uh, these are given by uh, topologies, you know, various topologies. Uh, and if you think about connecting different universes, then this is the natural thing that comes uh, to mind. Now, what's going to happen is that the effect that we'll be discussing would be much larger than these effects. They dominate, dominate the spectral form factor at much earlier times, and they are not related in any way to wormholes. I mean, you can see that from, you can understand it from the fact that they would be much larger 
they go like uh, this n choose p to the minus one and, and not uh, two to the minus n. Uh, so these are not the uh, standard uh, wormholes, rather they are uh, something a little bit uh, different. And uh, another uh, reference is, is the issue of uh, the page curve. Again, this is uh, uh, the behavior at, uh, at late times. Uh, what we're trying to do is ask questions which are more relevant to perhaps shorter time scales. Uh, one of them is what is the dual uh, of, a, of a single realization that's related to the question of what happens in higher dimension, uh, or how does information uh, come out of the black hole. So, so maybe what we're saying would be relevant uh, for that, because we'll be finding many more fields in the near horizon of these black holes. Uh, so maybe it's related, maybe not, that's still a work in progress. Of course, there are many, many more puzzles. Uh, so if, if these are the kind of uh, questions which are, are kind of standard uh, in the field, uh, our approach would be, if you wish, a little bit uh, more gradual. So, so suppose I don't want to go directly from uh, an ensemble average with uh, on, on the full Gaussian ensemble average of the J. Suppose I want to go and, and kind of give you information bit by bit. Okay, so, so I'm going to, uh, so what does that, uh, so, so how do I, so the question is going to be operationally, how do I take that into account in the bulk? You know, what kinds of bells and whistles do I need uh, uh, to introduce in the bulk if I want to describe, say, the dual of something which is a Gaussian up to one bit of information that they give you. So it's almost Gaussian. It's, it's a slightly constrained Gaussian distribution. So, so how would I, uh, you know, what do I need to do in the bulk in order to uh, describe this? So what's the kind of information that I'm interested in? So, so of course the first information uh, is just uh, the sum over the Ji squared. So, so the Ji is a random variable. The sum over Ji squared is another random variable, and it uh, and it fluctuates. And this will, of course, be related to this this uh, shrinking or expanding the spectrum that we said before, because this sets the overall size of this of, uh, uh, of the overall energy. So this is going to be one uh, random uh, variable. So suppose I ask you, you know, what's the dual of the theory if I tell you that uh, the distribution is Gaussian uh, J's with the constraint that the expectation value is slightly off what you thought it was. So of course this, you know, it, it would be very easy to guess what the answer is and that's what we're going to get. But then you can go and ask something more complicated. So suppose I tell you what's the real uh, sum over J I squared then also what's the real uh, cubic invariant of the J. So, so what's the cubic invariant? So uh, right, so, so I can think about each multi-index i as a, a, a vector of, of zeros and ones. Zero if a specific chi i doesn't show up in this uh, multi-index of j, and one if it does show up, and then I can build an invariant like this. Okay, so this is an SON invariant. Really, the SON is not the main thing. It's more, it's, it's related to, you know, when would traces in the operator algebra be non-zero, et cetera, et cetera. But, but let's for, for now think about this as so any invariant. So uh, this is going to be another piece of information that I can give you. So the list of these SON invariants is the same of uh, is the same as specifying J, of course, up to SON transformations, which don't do anything. And we're going to call them fluctuation parameters. And the game is, you know, how do I need to cook up the dual if I give you the first fluctuation parameter, second, third, et cetera, et cetera, in some, uh, in some grading. Uh, the effect of each fluctuation parameter will be smaller and smaller. So its contribution to the multi-trace correlator will be smaller and smaller. So, uh, okay, so as I said, this H2 is going to be responsible just for this uh, parameter H that we saw before that just uh, dilates the spectrum. And uh, so if I go to H3 and above, uh, actually something new is going to happen. 
Uh, in order to realize them, and I'm going to tell you what are the rules for realizing them in gravity, uh, I'm going to have to add a, a lot of light fields. Well, for, at first, you know, just for H3, I won't need to add a lot, but uh, you see from the construction that as I go to higher and higher fluctuation parameters, I need to add more and more fields if I want to have a reasonable gravitational description. So, so you would say that, so I, I would say that these fields have to be there if you want to describe multi-trace correlators in any gravitational way. Of course, it could be that you don't want to do it, but you know, have some other set of rules. Now, um, of course, for this guy, if I just have a transformation, capital H goes to little h times capital H, then I can transfer this to JT gravity or, or any other description that I want of H. I just need to kind of rescale slightly different elements in the effective Lagrangian, such that at the end of the day, I will be rescaling the Hamiltonian. And in that sense, I'm going to say that we have a, a way of transferring things to, to the bulk. Um, okay, some comments. Uh, yeah, this is what he said. By bulk, we mean the effective Hamiltonian after doing the remaining ensemble average. Sorry, Mika, Mika, yeah, yeah, sorry to interrupt you. I just, um, and it may be my fault because I may have zoned out at the wrong time, but I want to understand the bulk interpretation again. Could you just go back once? One okay. Sorry. Um, so um, I totally appreciate your approach of going, going, you know, kind of interpolating in the way you explain, but um, okay. uh, when you say um, you're talking about these multi trace correlators, meaning like this H to the K, so it's like, Mm -hmm. multiple, I mean, if, if it were higher dimensional theory, that would mean multiple gravitons, but it's not a higher dimensional theory. Right. No. Right. So it's not about multiple gravitons. Um, mm -hmm. But what is the fact that it's multi-trace imply in this dimensionality? Maybe that's the question I'm trying to ask. Um, like, in other words, in higher... Um. Um, okay, let me, um, so, 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 you see, I mean, really the fact, uh, okay, let, let me, let me write here. So, you see, I, I, I it, it, okay, so, so uh, I basically, you know, the, the object that one usually evaluates, right, is, is Z of beta, which is expectation value of E to the minus beta H. Okay. Yes. So that's fine. That that's something that you can do in any dimension that you're interested. Right. It's not right. directly related to multigravitons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, now uh, here I am putting trace. I'm thinking about trace h to the k in the derivation, and I'm probably not presenting it in the best way because what I will always be doing, I'm will be computing trace e to the minus beta h, except that I will always think about this as an expansion of this type. Oh, okay, okay. So it's building up for the right. function and that, is, right. and, and that is why, and that is why it will have something to do with couplings of the theory. Right, yeah. exactly, so, exactly. So, so now I'm going to have some a multi-trace guy and, and really I'm going to think about it as if I'm evaluating this guy. Right, so I'm, I'm, I want to have some effective description uh, of this. Well, okay, let, let, let me, I, I probably should have, I, I, again, I apologize. I, I think I chose the worst set of uh, uh, formulas here. Uh, if you wish, you can transfer this into the fact that uh, e to the minus beta a trace, beta one trace e to the minus beta two h, is integral dh p of h and then uh, z of beta 1 h z of beta 2 h where these guys are just uh, uh, the partition functions that correspond to trace e to the minus beta h okay mm -hmm. so, uh, so so basically what i'm saying is that you have these two universes 
so this is beta. Uh, yeah, okay. So this is again beta little h. So I have these two universes, yeah. and you basically think that uh, you know if you're if you're doing the field theory, I tell you, you know, one of them is in uh, is in a hundred uh, Kelvin, and the other is in a thousand Kelvin. Uh, you know, okay, that's the information I give you from the outside. But actually, what you're going to get is that uh, when you transfer this temperature to the gravity, there's a slight fluctuation. The, you need to fudge things a little bit in order to see the temperature that the gravity sees. And uh, this fudging has to do with the fact that uh, the coefficient, actually, this H2 fluctuates a little bit. And if you have two universes, then the eight, this H2 is the same in the two universes, so the fudging has to be the same, and there's a distribution on this fudging. And therefore, you have a correlation, a non trivial correlation in the energy spectrum of these two universes. Okay, but I'll, I'll write the formulas a little bit uh, more precisely, but, but basically, you should just, you know, whenever you see this M to the K, think about going to the partition function. Under okay. the assumption that the sum of the moments converges and, and it does for reasonable observables. Okay, got it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I think I'll just skip to the. Okay, so, so okay, so, so, um, um, okay, so all of this is very tentative and uh, all of this will apply to times which are much below the ramp and slope. Etc. But it does affect the ramp and slope because if I slightly change a two, then I, I'm kind of changing the energy, the energy scale, and that will shift the time where say the the ramp and slope show up. Okay, so so let's uh, do some of the mechanics. Um, so so let's evaluate this kind of, of an observable. Okay, of course the expectation value. Um, uh, okay, so, so, so actually, I'm, I'm going to do all the all the combinatorics for this case because in the other cases it's more complicated, but it's basically very similar. Uh, okay, so, so so what I'm interested in is is again h to the k one uh, trace h to the k two, and uh, each of these h's is a sum over j i psi i. This is a multi-index. A psi i1 up to psi i p, and i is this uh, multi set, multi index set. Okay, this is the standard construction. So this is just one h, this is the last h in this uh, trace, this is the first h in this trace, this is the last h in, uh, in the second trace. Okay, so, so I've just expanded, just so the, the Explicitly, I've inserted the sum over the different terms that show up in the Hamiltonian. And now um, I need to uh, uh, compute this expectation value. And I'm interested in computing the connected piece. So, so the connected piece uh, uh, will basically happen when one of the J's here is contracted uh, with one of the J's here. Remember that the J's are uh, Gaussian, so I can just think about the Gaussian integration as a weak contraction. So, so of course, uh, you know, many of them can be contracted here, but I need that at least some of them would be contracted between the traces. And, and this is a kind of computation that uh, the people here uh, did uh, long before uh, any of this uh, project started even. Uh, so, so, so let's introduce some uh, some notation or, or some diagrammatics. So, suppose I want to compute trace h to the fourth cubed expectation value. So, I'm I'm kind of stepping back from the restriction of two traces, and I'm doing a general number of traces. Uh, so, because of the Wicks, okay. So, so I have uh, uh, three traces. Each of them has four Hamiltonian insertions, and I'm going to describe. Uh, each trace by a circle and the Hamiltonians, Hamiltonians in it by dots. And contracting J's mean, I'm going to describe that by this uh, dashed line between them, which I refer to as, uh, as a code. So, so uh, if I have, for example, trace H4 cubed, 
then I'm going to have uh, this kind of uh, diagram where the J say in the, in the first trace are contracted between themselves, but there is some contraction between the J's in the two other traces. Or I can have a fully connected one, which will contribute to the connected piece. So this is uh, one description. It just uh, shows the weak contraction of the J's. But there's another way where another way of describing it, which is uh, more efficient, which is uh, each of these traces will be denoted by a, a dot, which uh, when I get it straight would be a square dot. And the number of, uh, of edges that go, the number of uh, lines that go from one trace to the other would be uh, the edges in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, new graph. So uh, this diagram just goes over to this guy, and this diagram goes over to this guy. Uh, is this clear? Because I'll be using a lot this uh, this description. Uh, it it basically looks like some kind of a Feynman diagram, and many of the rules of Feynman diagrams apply to it. Is this uh, more or less okay? Okay, let me assume that the answer is yes. <laughs> um, Okay, so um, uh, so so let's go back to to two traces, and uh, the point is is the following. Let's say um, let's take uh, the simplest diagram, which is just uh, you know just take uh, two nodes in the first trace and connect them over here, and then have whatever set of chords that I'm interested. In connecting the, J, the, the remaining H's, okay? So, so what does that mean? It basically means that you see now the, situa now the situation is the following. So here I have some index I, and here I have some index I, and here a priori I have some index I prime, and here I also have some index I prime because I just told you that I correlate this guy with this guy and this guy with this guy. All other index sets, are paired among themselves in some funny way, okay? So what does that mean? It means that each of the chi's, uh, so each of the psi's that shows up in each of these index sets that are paired, it shows up twice, and psi i squared is zero. So all of these guys have fermions that show up twice, and, and okay, I'm going to have some combinatorics associated with, with them, but it will be a non-zero result. So the only thing I'm going to have is a trace of the psi that show up in this index set times the psi that show up in this index set. And the psi have to be uh, paired, right? Each psi for each species has to appear twice. So that tells me that this index, these index sets are the same. They have to be the same. That's why I'm going to have a, a diagram which is suppressed because I'm not just identifying pairs but here I need to identify four of these guys, okay? So what I'm going to have is an expression like this. So this index i, this index i shows up twice in each of the diagrams, but now since I'm doing the trace independently here and here, I might as well keep the index i here. You know, and here I have a sum over i, but I'm doing each of these trace, each of them shows up in a different trace, then up to an additional suppression factor, this is going to be as if I'm computing a, a sum over two distinct index sets. Okay. The set is going to be the same as this guy, and this guy is going to be the same as this guy. That's going, that's going to determine the trace. The traces don't really care if this guy is exactly the same as this guy. This just shows up from the weak contractions, okay? So I'm going to liberate the requirement that here I have the same index. I'm going to turn those into different indices. I'm going to have another summation. And the price that I'm going to, that I have to introduce is I've really overcounted by some huge amount. So I need to introduce another and choose P to the minus one to make up for that. Okay, is this clear? I mean, this is basically the only piece of combinatorics that I'm going to uh, to use. Uh, so, so basically that means that uh, if I start from this diagram, 
uh, really, uh, and I know that this guy is connected here and this guy is connected here, I mean, the, the index sets are the same, really this guy is the same as this guy and this guy is the same as this guy. So it's really interactions of pairs if you're interested, even though initially it started its life as, a, as an interaction of J's. And that has to do, that's a combination of the weak contraction and the, and, the, and the trace structure of the, of the Majorana film. Now, uh, now, you see, now the point is that each of these things is, if I think about just evaluating the trace, this is just the same as this guy. The trace is going to be the same. So I have a product of two M's. And the only thing that I need to tell you is, which pair is correlated with each pair. So they're just combinatorics, you know, take a pair here, take another pair here, declare them to be the same. And uh, what you're going to have is this suppression factor and some factor that has to do with how many pairs, how many codes you have on one side, which is K over two, K one over two times how many codes you have on the other side, which is K two over two. And then there's some additional factor which gives you overall this expression. Okay, so, uh, and you see, I, I really don't need to tell you anything about M, okay? This just had to do with the Gaussian uh, behavior and the pairing behavior of, uh, of the fermion. You could put in the exact M if you're interested for finite P, for finite N, you can do the low energy and go to JT, you can, you can, uh, uh, you can put in the double scale expression, you know, the details of, how of this M really don't matter that much. Uh, okay, so, so uh, this- uh, This only works if uh, there's only two pairs connected, this- uh, Right, right. Uh -huh. Yes, and I'm going to- like More pairs, they're subleading corrections. They are subleading and I'm going to give you expressions for those. And does those make it non-factorized? Does those make it uh, the result non-factorized? Uh, I mean, this is going to give you uh, this expression uh, this is going to give you this expression, yeah, which yeah. in general doesn't factorize, right? It's not uh, something times something. You, you really, uh, you would really see the full structure of P. Mm. Okay. You mean just keep, sorry, just keeping the leading correction? Yeah, I mean, th th this is just the leading correction for two trace, uh, for two trace. Uh, I'll show yeah, you that factorizes, second. right? This, this the, the, factorizes. Yeah, this specific one factorizes, but all the higher ones don't. Right, okay. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. Right. But, but you see that they would still be given by simple operations on this, uh, on these, uh, on the partition functions, basically. Uh, okay, so, so if I give you this, and, and again, you resum this to, uh, to the partition function. Uh, so, so basically, right, uh, you know, each of these k's tells you that you act with some derivative on the partition function. So this is going to be uh, the connected piece uh, of the two trace uh, partition function. And from this, you can extract uh, the change for rho, which is the expression that they had before. Okay, there are some caveats. Let me, and, and this issue of lack of universality, let me not uh, get into that. Now, suppose I want to compute, so, so let's now do something a little bit more complicated, which is compute the leading order correction to several traces. Uh, so, so basically, the diagram that we had for a pair of traces was, uh, was this diagram. And uh, for three traces, uh, you can, uh, Again, you know, it's easier to encode this uh, in these diagrams. So, so this is MK1, MK2, MK3, or the partition function with some beta one, beta two, beta three. And I'm just telling you how many uh, weak pairs I have between the different uh, traces. So, so you see, so, so basically, again, I need to identify this guy, this index set with this index set and this index and this index set with this index set. And that already means that these two are identified. And from that, I can tell you what's the suppression in epsilon, right? So here I had to identify this guy with this guy. And then this was automatically okay. And that came with the power of epsilon. 
right, because I identify two index sets. Here I need to identify three index sets, which basically means that this diagram is of order epsilon squared. Okay. And, and generally, if I have a cyclic diagram, something like this, this is going to give you epsilon to the V minus one, where V is the number of traces that you have. Uh, but but uh, if, you, if you go through this, you can actually see that there are many uh, diagrams that contribute. So for example, uh, and, and this would be what's called cactus diagram, which I'm going to describe in a second. So for example, if you ask, if you check how many uh, lines are identified, how many index sets of lines associated with lines are identified in these two diagrams, uh, you identify this, these two, these two, and these two. So this is going to give you an epsilon cube. And the same is true for, uh, for this guy. So you're going to get a sum over different graphs uh, at the leading order. At leading order, this would be the cactus diagrams. And of course, there are uh, sub-leading orders. So I'm going to compute these guys. And I have nothing to say on these guys because they mix up with higher fluctuation parameters. Okay. So um, let, let me just uh, define, and, and I'm not going to, uh, to prove anything. Uh, so if I think about the traces of vertices on the graph and the identification of index sets uh, as edges, then, uh, okay, then basically all my construction can be encoded in graphs. A path is a sequence of uh, edges that doesn't uh, uh, intersect itself. And the cycle is, is, is a path that closes. Again, and I don't allow any intersection in, in uh, edges and therefore also in, uh, in vertices. Uh, and, uh, and what I'm interested in, and the, the graphs that would be relevant for me are cactus graphs uh, in which no pairs of cycles share an edge. And the claim is, I'm not going to prove this, is that the leading order contribution to the connected moments uh, is of order epsilon to the V minus one and comes from one PI cactus graph. So it's cactus graphs and uh, there are no single lines that I can cut and I split it uh, into two. And, and these basically are, are, are trees of uh, bubbles, if you're in, if, uh, you know, that's another way of drawing them. So I have these bubbles. Uh, uh, sorry, you know, for uh, example. Could uh, you remind uh, us what was V again? Sorry to okay. uh, V is the number of traces. Okay. I mean, probably called it N or probably three other names by now, but uh, here it will be V for vertices. Okay, thank you. Okay. Right, so, so, so this is a cactus graph. Uh, this is a cactus, uh, I'm sorry. This is a cactus graph right? because this is one, uh, this is one cycle, this is another cycle and they don't have an overlapping edge. Uh, this guy is not because there's this cycle and there's this cycle and they have an overlapping edge, okay. So, 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 uh, so, so a cactus is basically bubbles that you kind of glue them together. Uh, you choose a point on the bubble, you stick it on another bubble, and, uh, and these points are traces. And of course, I can have as many other traces with one line coming in and one line coming out on, a, on top of these, uh, on this bubble structure. And, and if you want to see how you get this epsilon to the V minus one, you can basically just uh, start trimming this cactus and seeing that uh, how the rank behaves. Uh, and and uh, um, so, uh, and again, but, but the point is that if, for example, I just focus on this trace, then uh, I have something like this and something like this. But the index set here is the same as this, and this index set could be a different index set, uh, but these two lines are the same. Right? The index set is common to the line that describes this uh, bubble. So again, this uh, just looks like some M of K, right? because all the indices are, are paired, and I can use the same reasoning as, uh, as before. So what I'm going to get is that the connected uh, partition function is just a sum over these cactus diagrams and then some 
combinatorial factor that translates into derivatives with respect to beta acting on the old partition functions. Okay. And, uh, and, and this is, a, and, and basically the number of uh, insertions of this operator is the degree of the edge, which is uh, how many lines, the degree of the, uh, of the vertex, which is how many lines come out of it. But we saw when we had two lines, we just had beta d beta. When we have four lines, that would roughly be square. But again, it's all the same simple set of transformations that you do on M of K. So write an expression like this is the number of edges, number of vertices, etc., etc. Uh, how much time do I have? Because uh, I'm kind of halfway through. And... Yeah, so we are at the one hour mark, but there were yeah. uh, some questions. So maybe we can make it like uh, 15 minutes more or how, uh, that would be perfect. Okay. Now that, that would be perfect. Like, okay. Great. Thanks. Um, uh, however, yeah. How much time? Okay. Okay. Uh, okay so, so this is some closed expression that, uh, that you can generate, but of course you can repackage it much more easily. And, and that also shows you how space time emerges in this uh, picture. So, uh, okay. So, 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 so what do we have basically? So, um, right, if I give you M, uh, if, if I have some, uh, okay, let's go back to this diagram where, where I have a single trace and different uh, H's on it. And I pair this uh, and, and I have some pairing of these guys. Okay. Uh, and now I tell you that uh, the J here, actually this J, was correlated with a J in another trace. Okay, this is how this whole thing started, right? This guy is correlated with this, and this guy is the same. So it's actually uh, these four guys that are uh, correlated with each other. Okay, I'm basically computing the expectation value of some J i to the four. Okay, so uh, so the way that I can do this, I can just write this diagram. And here I'm, and now by the time I reach the, this diagram, I'm summing over all the index, in the, all the index sets that run in these things. So if I want to keep track of these J's and how they correlate to each other, then this diagram is just a M a K multiplied by sum over J I squared. There should actually be an epsilon here for normalization. Epsilon is N choose P to the minus one. So what I do in this approach, I first do the traces over the fermions. That's enough to leading order to just pair the index set, because again, each species should appear at least uh, twice. And I'm going to keep the, the J's fluctuating and only then do the integral over the J's. And if I do the integral over the J's at the end, then I can correlate the, the J's between the two uh, traces, okay? So what this thing amounts to is uh, I'm going to define now M, which is the M that I'm going to get if H2, the sum over J I squared is slightly uh, shifted, which is just the expression when H2 equals one, uh, that, that, let's take this to be the canonical normalization that I'm using. And then there's going to be a factor, which is just these additional factor of some J I squared epsilon multiplying the whole thing. And this shows up to the power K over two because I have K over two cores. Okay. So now basically I've brought back my expression to the standard expression where I do the full ensemble average. However, I allow this additional fluctuation. Uh, however, at this stage, you know, the, this, this H2 is just epsilon sum over J I squared. And I haven't done the integral over J I. So if I want to do the integral over, so I, I now go and do the integral over J I, and I'm going to get that uh, M, is just do the integral over J I, and then the product 
of these MKs where I've kind of dilated uh, each of them by, uh, by the appropriate power, okay? Uh, so these phi's are uh, to be understood as close relatives of J. There, there is some slight semantical difference, which is why in the paper we treat them differently, but, but uh, physically they are basically, they're basically the same. So the correlation function is just do this integral. And this is just the original Gaussian measure that you have over the Ji's. Uh, and, and if you wish, uh, you again go to the partition function and you see that the partition function, if I give you some external beta one up to beta AI is just take these N partition functions at the betas that you thought you were using shrink or expand each of them uh, a little bit by this fluctuation parameter and then do the expectation value over this fluctuation parameter. Uh, this reproduces all the cactus diagrams that, uh, that I showed you before. Uh, again, there is some semantical, there is some slight difference between the phi's and the j's, which is why it's better to start with the diagrammatic, but uh, it's, it's not a huge difference. It's first uh, approximation. Uh, so, so this is going to be my uh, integral or this version, yeah, epsilon phi is just this integral d phi i e to the minus sigma i phi i squared over two epsilon. And then I plug in whatever z's I want over here, uh, uh, slightly deformed. Of course, what I can do now, since, uh, since all of this is invariant under uh, orthogonal transformation of these phi i's, I can just go to a single integral on H2, which is just the length of this vector. So what I'm going to have at the end of the day is some expression where uh, I, I compute a uh, space times, I take the space times, I compute their, expect, their partition function with the temperature which is slightly different and the amount by which this temperature is slightly different than what I thought it is in the field theory, that amount is encoded by H2 and this H2 is correlated between all the universes and that's why I get a connected piece in the partition function. Of course from this I'm just supposed to take the, the leading connected piece. And of course, at this stage, again, I, I really didn't tell you what Z is and, and I really don't care what Z is. I just use the fact that it came from some Gaussian ensemble. I can take uh, the Schwarzian action if I'm interested. I can take the partition function at all scales. I'm doing the large P limit. I can take the double scale transfer matrix. Uh, or, or I can just say that this, uh, this uh, partition function comes from uh, JT gravity or maybe with some other extension. And then what I'm supposed to do, I'm just supposed to uh, use uh, gravity at a slightly different temperature. Or if I want to keep the same temperature, you know, keep the metric the same, what I will have to do is, is slightly fudge the co various coefficients in the Einstein, uh, in the JT action in order to get this uh, change. This is something we haven't done uh, uh, explicitly. Uh, but, but in principle, you can kind of reverse in the engineer this Z of beta H into a, a deformation of the gravitational action. So, uh, okay, is this clear or uh, roughly clear? Sorry, yeah. just, just, just to make sure. So this mm -hmm. formula, you said it's a uh, leading order uh, connected piece, but uh, it, yes. it will be exact for uh, SYK because you'll just have. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, Th this is an exact formula for SYK at mm -hmm. leading order for an arbitrary number of traces. At leading order of what? Uh, with respect to. A, a, with respect to this. Uh, so, so, a, a, so I'm, I, I have to. Uh, I take this expression, I evaluate it, I go to the connected piece, 
Yeah. The connected piece has an express started uh, at power epsilon to the, I guess, n minus one in this language. Mm -hmm. And this formula captures correctly the coefficient of this epsilon to the n minus one as a sum of the cactus diagrams. Uh huh. Okay. I see. But in principle, like, I can mm -hmm. go to arbitrary order of epsilon. It's also a sum over uh, those product of these, but just uh, with different. Uh, what, say different that again. Uh, uh, how, uh, how about uh, higher orders in epsilon? Okay. So 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 I'm going to go to. I mean, you can go to higher orders in epsilon, but what's going to happen is that there are additional fluctuation modes which are a little bit trickier to discuss which mix uh, uh, with this fluctuation mode at higher orders and you'll see i'm going to discuss the next uh, i'm going to discuss the first sub leading correction to this and you'll already see that it's a little bit tricky mm -hmm. and uh, so so that but but in principle you need to take into account more fluctuation parameters but those are not not present for uh, SYK, right? SYK only has no, no. They, they will be present. They will definitely will be present. Okay. They, they will definitely be present. I mean, the old computation is SYK. You, you'll see in a minute. Uh, okay. So, so, so basically, if I want to do a single realization, I can now ask, you know, uh, with the leading information about the fact that this is the lead the single realization is just what's the size of the sum J I squared. So suppose I want to just give you that piece of information, then it just is given by uh, say JT gravity at a temperature which is slightly different than what you thought it was. Okay. Uh, okay, so, so let's go to, okay, so let, let me just say one thing uh, about time scale. So, so if I want to compute the spectral, so, so basically our results agree to some extent with results in the literature when you are kind of working at the middle of the distribution, away from the middle of the distribution, they, they, they are not the same. Uh, basically, if I think about the spectral form factor, then you know these are the two terms that have been discussed in the literature, the connected piece. And then, uh, uh, and, and then uh, this piece and this piece, and we're basically adding this guy, and it, is, and it describes pretty well the numerical results that we see. I mean, to, to the to the level of precision that you expect, because we know what are the subleading corrections, and, and we can estimate what's the error that we expect, and it works pretty well. Uh, okay, so so really, all of this was just a setup for uh, this uh, new fluctuation parameter business. Okay, so, so let's now discuss uh, uh, two uh, traces, for example, and let's see the case where it's not just two lines that go between them, but there are three lines, uh, three J's that are correlated between them, okay. uh, something like this. And I'm going to focus on the case where I'm computing trace H cubed, uh, trace H cubed, okay. So now I have index sets I1, I2, and I3. And if I want all the fermions in this index set to appear twice, then what I'm supposed to do, okay, let's call this a hat. What I'm supposed to do, I'm supposed to split each of them into two uh, uh, multi-fermions or split each index set into two and have, so this would be I1 hat, this would be I2 hat, and this would be I3 hat. Okay, this is a way in which, this is the only way in which I can satisfy that each fermion uh, will appear twice for I1 hat, I2 hat, and I3 hat. Uh, uh, so what I'm going to have is a sum over these i's uh, and they are of length p over two. Okay, and then I have a product of uh, two traces like this. Uh, and of course, there is some combinatorial. Uh, okay, and, th and this is basically something which you can evaluate. It's not a complicated, and you get some. Uh, this would be either zero or non-zero. Let's focus on the case where it's non-zero, and this is going to give me uh, some suppression factor, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's more suppressed than uh, say the case where I have two of these guys, obviously. Uh, now, uh, suppose I want to compute uh, this with some with 
now I want, instead of this guy, I want to compute this guy. Then basically I have these psi's, these pairs that I've generated. And I'm going to add as many H's as I'm interested. Okay. So what I'm going to have is uh, that this, uh, this, the connected piece of this guy is something like this. Uh, go over all the Hamiltonian, go, you know, look at the two traces. In each of them, choose three Hamiltonians and, and think about these Hamiltonians three Hamiltonians as coming from pairs of, uh, of uh, multi-interactions and all the other H's keep the same as H's, right? So these guys are just some uh, bunch of, uh, you keep them as H's. So now what, what does this thing look? I mean, you can go and, and of course there's some, you know, there's the same combinatorial factor and there's this overall suppression factor that was already there because th these guys weren't there when K1 and K2 were three. Uh, so, so what the, of course, and then you can go and evaluate, uh, say an expression like this in the double scale or, or whatever you're interested. But what does this thing look like uh, for any model? I claim that this is just a six point function of random operators of size P over two. Okay, right? because in the arrangement of indices, this is I1, I2, these two are correlated, these two are correlated, these two are correlated. And the point is that this is just true in a single W. In another dub, in the other W, of course, the full index sets are correlated, but again, by the same argument, I can think about this as summing independently different index sets in the two traces plus an additional suppression factor. So this guy is just a six point function of operators uh, with length P over two or dimension one half. So for every model I claim that this is an exact expression, uh, I can write this higher fluctuation parameter using integrated uh, six point function and just correlate the coefficient of this integrated six point function. And I really don't need to give you the expression. I'm going to evaluate this correlator in whatever way that you're uh, that you're interested. Uh, and and of course you can go and you can write a model which is uh, very similar. So if you remember before, we just took m k to some m k times this factor. Now we basically need to add some additional factor. But but this is really where the information sits that it's just a six point function. Uh, and, and again, you can write something, you can write a very similar expression. You see, I have this guy, right? This guy is basically just uh, in a single trace. I give you I1, I2, I3. When is this trace non zero? It's when I1 hat, so I2, so I three hat equals zero. Okay, and therefore I get a new fluctuation parameter, which is just write this invariant uh, of the J's that you are interested. So the leading fluctuation of, uh, of the distribution is just the size. The sublead, the first subleading is some funny deformation of the distribution. Uh, and this is what I'm going to call H three. And similar to before, you can uh, write the connected piece as the connected part of some uh, integration over now two fluctuation parameters, H2 and H3 with some distribution. And then here you're going to have some partition function which we can basically write down. Again, it's some simple modification of the Hamiltonian. Um, which uh, before it was just H2 multiplying beta one, now there's going to be an additional H3. And I want this guy to be related to a six point function because I need to generate those W's that I had before. I think I'm going a little bit fast, but just to, but uh, let, let me just uh, skip the derivation and just uh, tell you what, uh, what the expression looks like. So uh, before, when we just had the H2 fluctuation parameter, 
we basically uh, I basically told you that you need to turn your Hamil you need to to multiply your Hamiltonian by h2. The expectation value of h2 was one in the full ensemble, and if the ensemble fluctuates, then I just need to use a rescaled Hamiltonian. And then there was a p of h2, and when I integrated that, I got the correlation between the different universes. <coughs> What's going to happen now is that it's it's going to be a little bit uh, trickier. What what you have to replace your Hamiltonian, you're still going to have the same term. But what you're going to have to do is add this uh, uh, additional operator with dimension a half, and deform the Hamiltonian by a double trace deformation in the sense of ABS-CFT that has to do with this O2 or with O squared. H3 is the coefficient of this guy. And there's going to be another <coughs> random variables with random variable which takes uh, these values with uh, equal probability. Okay. So this is going to be my new Hamiltonian. Uh, the, I don't know if a systematic way of deriving it. it. There's basically some guesswork involved. You just check that it reproduces the right uh, diagrams. Uh, so, for example, if we want to reproduce the diagram that we said before, we need to put in, when we expand the Hamiltonian, we're going to put in three O2s, and that generates these uh, codes of uh, smaller operators correlated between these two uh, universes. So this is going to be my effective Hamiltonian. And if I want, and this is the partition function for a fixed fluctuation parameter. And what I'm instructed to do, if I want to compute again, uh, Z uh, of uh, beta one up to Z beta N expectation value connected, it's going to be an integral of this guy. And then Z effective of beta H2, H3, uh, beta one, up to Z effective beta N H2, H3. So H2 and H3 are, is the information that is shared between the different universes and it tells you how you deform, uh, how you deform the fluctuation and you have to introduce this additional field O and you have to introduce another discrete parameter which is something like a discrete flux in your model. Again, this is guesswork. Uh, I, I mean, you can show that this reproduces the correct set of diagrams. I mean, it's not a complete story, but a specific set of diagrams and uh, uh, that are reproduced. Uh, okay, so so let me maybe summarize. Uh, you can ask about what happens when you add the information about the fluctuation kind of bit by bit. And this is the thing that uh, that happens. And the, the, the kind of main thing is that if you want to have a gravitational description, it tells you that you need to introduce these additional light fields. And as you go to higher and higher fluctuation par parameters, you need to introduce more and more of these fields. So if you're an outside observer and you have these probes, it tells you that you have all of these O's sitting here with lighter and lighter dimension which you basically cannot couple to. So they kind of have to be there if you want to have a good gravitational description of these multi-trace uh, uh, multi correlators. Uh, I think I'm going to end here because uh, um, I'm way out of time and I apologize. Okay, so let me finish here. Okay, uh, thanks a lot Mika for the very nice talk. Are there uh, uh, questions for Mika? Yeah, I have a, a short question, quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, could you get this uh, separation directly starting from like a G sigma action um, approach where you're like, sorry, maybe not G sigma, but maybe just uh, by separating yeah. genes into different uh, fields with respect to your st st statistics? Uh, Okay, so so uh, we kind of 
Uh, okay, so, so for H, you can get H2 from G sigma, but H2 is kind of very simple, right? Because you're not introducing more degrees of freedom that you need to, to worry about. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't tried the, the more complicated guy. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how to get H3 from, from G sigma. Mm. Well, just your, your picture sounds like reasonable, right? Uh, you correlate those different boundaries with these J's. But each J times those fermions. So it's like, uh, so there's the overall temperature and mode, and then there's like right. operator modes. But you, yeah. you somehow make it more precise by manipulating these diagrams. So I just wonder whether just uh, directly from the action, one can see like the separations by just to separate the J's. For, for 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 H two it works uh, very uh -huh. very very simply in J sigma and it, it basically uh, has to do with these yeah I mean the, I mean the, using these phi's which are J's that I that I discussed before H three I don't know I I mean I mean part of it is that uh, really I mean the, this action that they said doesn't capture all the fluctuations to do with H three. It just has to do with uh, just a very restricted set of diagrams where I have two of these, mm -hmm. uh, only two of these uh, traces where three lines emanate, and the rest are just the H two fluctuation basically. Yeah. So so just these diagrams are reproduced with the action that. Uh, uh, that I wrote with H2 and H3, I, I don't even know, you know, suppose I want to do something that has six of these three legged uh, traces, I, I don't even know how to do that. We haven't classified all the diagrams that are relevant for that. So that's, uh, I, I mean, <laughs> clearly there's, there should be a more elegant way of uh, doing all of this mess, not just uh, you know, tying legs and then guessing what the effective action is kind of embarrassing. But uh, um, I, I, I think the main statement is that uh, it always looks like looks like some a like some higher endpoint function of lighter operators. I mean that part is is fine. It always looks like an integrated six point function or eight point function or whatever. Now. The point is, if you want to write it as a local deformation, say of the Hamiltonian, then that's an additional uh, requirement, and that's where things start getting complicated, and you need to introduce this additional uh, chi uh, discrete flux of some sort, and that, that it becomes a bit murky. I say thank you. Uh, I have a very naive question. So just with the H2, you had this formula for Z of beta one up to beta N mm -hmm. integral dH, P of H. It mm -hmm. also works for a single beta or not, uh, that formula? Uh, I mean, okay, so, so, so basically, okay, you're asking, you know, suppose I, I just think about, you know, what's the meaning of an expression like this? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so so I would say that the, the answer is is no because the the input into this black box is always what's z of beta. So for example, what's the full exact z of beta that you put in, and you don't compute any corrections to it. If you want to think about this corrections, and you say you know suppose I start say with the leading expression in one over n for this. Uh, you know, is this any interesting quantity, then I would say that the answer is also no, because this would give you corrections to this object that go like epsilon, but presumably there are already one over n corrections, just one over n, and not over n to the p corrections to the, to the single trace partition function. So, 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 yeah, so I, I don't think this, this transformation has by itself uh, uh, too, me, too much meaning. I mean, that's what I said. We're not really computing the Z's. We are computing the operators that act on the Z's, all the transformations that act on the Z's. Okay. okay. Fair enough. 
Thanks. Um, so do I understand right that if we consider just a correlation of two traces, like the K1 and K2, that um, mm -hmm. the different H's will contribute uh, to, to these, but with higher powers of like one over N to the Q? Uh, so, uh, it's not one over n to the q. It has to do with uh, uh, the combinatorics that. Uh, right. I, I mean, I, I, I don't even. Right. So, so this. Uh, uh, where was it? Just uh, so, so. For example, I mean, the thing I computed this. Uh, th this guy is exactly the power that you're going to get uh, if you're just doing two traces. I mean, this was the computation for two traces. And it's not exactly one over n to the p. It depends on the regime of uh, p's that you're uh, looking at. So it's a little bit more complicated. And then if you're looking at even higher fluctuation parameters, I mean, that, that, then it really gets unpleasant because there are uh, four index sets that you need uh, to do and then you have I1, I2, I3, I4, and you have the constraint that uh, the XOR of all of these guys is uh, zero and each of them is of length P. And there are many solutions to this uh, equation and each of them shows up with a slightly different power. So okay. at the level of, of four I's, you already get like a whole a set of uh, of different powers which are not that different from each other but they, they like span a whole range so it's not uh, just an expansion in one over n to the q one over n to the p in my language could it be okay but did, um could it be that the wormhole quote contribution to this thing is somehow mm -hmm. associated to the contribution of uh like h sub n or some very large index the um, so I would say, I mean, you, you could ask something like, you know, suppose I was able to write down an expression for all of these fluctuation parameters and I would go and resum there. Would I get uh, something like, uh, like the plateau? Okay, something like that. So I think the answer is, I think the answer is probably no because uh, um, you see, I, I, I'm, I'm always implicitly assuming that the moment method is giving me reasonable results. And that uh, means that the power of K that I'm using cannot scale like a power of N, which is too large which means that I cannot go to very large times in a reliable way. Or, or, or in other words, I think, uh, I, I don't think you can, I think it means you will not be able to resum this, but I don't think we have a good but argument to maybe, why exactly. Is it right that the higher, so H sub M for higher mm -hmm. values of M, um, the contribution is smaller if N mm -hmm. is large, but uh, maybe growing with K so that if K is very large, then the balance is shifted so that the higher values of M contribute and dominate. If, uh, uh, I'm not sure, if, if you take N to be large, uh, could you repeat? Uh, so what do you take to be large? Um, I, well, I was <laughs> changing course midstream. So like both, so if we start with the simplest case where N is large. Okay. And then uh, we look at the dependence on little M then I okay. think it's it's decreasing, so, right? The okay, no, so, sorry, so, trace h to the k. I, I okay. I'm not sure. What do you call the index that you had that was either two or three in most of the talk? The h sub two or h sub three? Uh, th this was the how many lines were correlated. What? Okay, what so, so let's. Uh, uh, let, I don't know. Let's call it the alpha just to make sure we don't. Okay. Get so maybe anything else? So maybe. Um, if n is the largest parameter, then these contributions are decreasing as we decreasing with alpha. Yeah, the strength of these is decreasing with alpha, but their number uh, proliferates. And if we increase very rapidly, if we make k large, 
then it mm -hmm. could be that uh, if K is big enough that like the other extreme end of alpha dominates. Like the yes. alpha equals two, alpha equals three. And then like somehow if K is big enough, the other end is important. And that could be the wormhole, the, the maximum values of alpha. Uh, right, right. So, 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 but I think in order to do that, you would need to resum something because the, the, because the number of H alphas I mean, just, just their number increases very rapidly because again, you, you have, you have a, an equation like this, but now with the alpha multi-indices mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and you can split those into uh, many ways in which you divide the indices, right? So let me just find some. Well, what about Alpha equal to k. If I give you, um, uh, okay. So, so the extreme case which we haven't analyzed is something like uh, I give you I have i one up to i n, I, I alpha, and then this is this is some multi index, okay. And I want to pair them. And in the case where alpha say is, is much larger than p then this basically is going to be something like there's a single guy here that is uh, here, there's a single guy here that goes here, uh, this guy's connected to something here. So, so, so I'm, I'm basically going to have some very sparse structure of uh, connection between these eyes. So each, each pair of eyes will have a single, I mean, the, the, what I'm going to have each of these eyes I mean, I'm going to have alpha of, alpha of these guys, and there's going to be a very sparse. Uh, there's going to be basically a very sparse uh, connection between them. And uh, so, so these are the index, index sets: uh, one, two, up to alpha, and uh, uh, and uh, this index set shares a single species index with this guy. And this guy shares a single index species with this guy. And this is going to be my generic configuration for, a, for an SON invariant. So uh, there, there, there would just be many of these guys and all of these would be slightly different. Uh, I mean, it's true that in some sense that they are all the same in some, uh, in some sense. I mean, the, the combinatorics will not be that different. They're all isomorphic, but they would be different uh, parameters and uh, you would have to resum them in some way if you want to get some coherent uh, uh, some coherent uh, wormhole. I mean I, I'm I'm kind of a little bit more intrigued about the other way of phrasing it which is that if I give you all of these parameters so I tell you that I have all of these additional light fields and you're not integrating over the coefficients, but you know, they show up in the action with some specific coefficient. Uh, would that mean, for example, that the wormhole is destabilized because you, you somehow want to say that uh, you kind of achieve, you know, you, you, you kind of want to regain factorization maybe in this, uh, in this uh, description. So, so it's not clear whether I mean, somehow taking into account these fields and and the fluctuations of their parameter of the of the parameters would be equivalent to a wormhole. But if you just take them without having these H's fluctuate, just take these fields without the H's fluctuating, would somehow mean that, that they destabilize the wormhole. It's it's. Uh, uh, I I mean, for, for sure, if I give you more and more information about the H's, then the plateau slightly changes. Right? If, if I just rescale the energy spectrum, then the plateau moves a little bit, right? I mean, nothing else changes. I just did an overall rescaling of the spectrum, but it still moved the plateau a little bit. So if I give you information about these H's, uh, which means, you know, some specific coefficients in the Hamiltonian coupling to some specific field, it affects what the wormhole does. But I, I don't know how to take into account all of them because, you know, we can, barely scraped to doing two of them at this stage. I wonder if there could be some connection to a interesting comment in the recent paper by Bauer 
Muko Matsanov about this half wormholes and the the, the uh, summation of the one over n to the q perturbation series around the half wormhole gives the wormhole. Maybe there could be some connection between that. And what you um, yeah, we, we thought about how connecting this to, about whether we can connect this to half wormholes. I mean, the problem is that the, the way that these things are set up is that a, I, I mean, we, we can argue that these feeds are there. We have no idea what they do in the bug. Because, and, and it's a little bit worse than that, because it seems like we are always changing the Hamiltonian by a multi-trace deformation in the sense of ADS CFT. And those tend to sit on the boundary. Uh -huh. So in that sense, it, it maybe it makes some sense that, you know, the, the deformations that you put, these additional terms in the Hamiltonian are multi-trace objects that sit on the boundary. These are all the global modes. And then the RMT piece is the piece that is the connection to the bulk. I mean, somehow that would put some order into this. But it's still true that uh, these, I mean, by the usual rules, you would still have these fields, you know, propagating in the bulk because it's still ADS-CFT in some form. And you kind of wonder what they do in the bulk. And, and we have no information about that, basically. I mean, other than con the conformal dimension, I've, I've no, I mean, in principle, we know what they are. You know, they are operators of some specific dimension that you put in the model and the, you can go and compute their effective action, but I, I don't know if a systematic way that will spit out the interesting pieces of that effective action. Somehow it feels like those two things that you described should not be completely disconnected from each other, right? The RMT piece and the, the global modes that maybe in between them, there's something that's always small and never very important, but that still, mm -hmm. that they should be connected somehow. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I I mean, I, I agree, but I, I don't know how to, I mean, maybe these, maybe these uh, spouse, I, I mean, if, I mean, you're probably right, and it, but it probably goes through these sparse uh, connections. I mean, it's, it's a little bit like the computations that you guys did uh, in, in the appendix that uh, you look at the at ladders, basically. At uh, you, you know, you have two traces, and you connect the uh, and you couple the J's in ladders, basically. And uh, and you compute uh, what's the expectation value of, of those guys. But then you sum over all the uh, all the ways that you pair up fermions. I, mean, I assume yeah. that's how you did the fermions. So so that's a little bit like that limit. Uh, the the limit where uh, uh, where k becomes large in in that case. So, so so I mean, the computation that you did there kind of sums over many of these fluctuation parameters uh, at the same time. It's an uncontrolled calculation, though. You, you're doing a you're doing a correct calculation here. We were just looking at some some terms in the sum. For... Right, right. So 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 so, but but I I think it's kind of going in that direction because. You would want to ask, you know, okay, so so I have all of these diagrams, and uh, which means that there are many fluctuation parameters, but they, but they are not that different from each other. So, uh -huh. can you just sum sum over all of them at the same time with some slightly other combinatorial trick? And that would be something along the lines of what you guys did, but I I, I haven't tried to set up this computation in our language to see how exactly it works out. Yeah, but, but yeah, I mean, yeah, as, as a speculation, I think it would go through these kinds of uh, objects.
Okay. Uh, anyone else have uh, any final question? Maybe just a comment that uh, indeed Bauer's calculation is like this technically very similar, right? It's just that uh, you cannot, we cannot like, um, so like the, so if there are like four, let's say insertions, like four traces, so they will all be connected like uh, among each other, right? There, there will not be any internal contractions, right? Because like it's zero dimensional. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So like the method is similar, but um, somehow it's different. So yeah, it's like the, the wormhole is like a disconnected piece, right? It's like one is connected to the other and another is connected, like the third one is connected to the fourth one and so on. And the half forms are also sort of disconnected. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I should need to think about that some more. Yeah, I'm not sure if I managed to express it. Yeah. Okay, if there are no more questions or comments, let's thank uh, Mika again for a very nice talk. Thanks for thank having you. me. Oh. Thank you.